Hello. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ms. Shipman First Class Christian Giggy, and today I have the great privilege, uh, privilege of introducing Mr. Peter DeMarco. So Mr. Peter DeMarco is an executive coach, organizational consultant, and ethics educator in the areas that affect leadership performance most. This includes communications, change, strategy, crisis management, risk, technology, and culture. He supports clients across a wide range of organizations and businesses. His work includes guest lectures and adjunct teaching on leadership and ethics to top tier MBA programs. His leadership experience includes C-level and senior executive assignments in the United States and Mexico while working for Latex Foam International, Bosch and Lam, and Xerox. He has held positions as Chief Executive Officer, CEO, and Chief Operating Officer, Division President, Managing Director, and Plant Manager. Mr. DeMarco has held prior management roles in operations, information technology, and quality engineering. He has also led the startup of two manufacturing facilities from construction through staffing and ongoing operations. An author of several dozen articles in his series, Leader Time, Peter's first book, The Goodwill Leader, The Goodwill Leader, is due to be published in late 2022. Prior to his business career, Peter enlisted in the United States Army, attended West Point, <laughs> um, and served in the airborne and mechanized infantry assignments. It is my great privilege to introduce Mr. Peter DeMarco. Thank you. Thanks, Christian. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Has everybody been able to dial in? I've got some hard devices up here for folks who um, can't get in, so if you um, want to come up, get a device, please return it. They won't work with your remote TV at home. All right. So uh, just to dial in, if you haven't clicked in yet, NALC 2022, and you'll be able to participate in today's presentation. So I want to begin uh, today's talk with a thank you to the Naval Academy. Um, first, uh, my oldest son was a Marine, uh, served from, uh, after graduating from college, 2005, he was offered OCS, wanted to enlist, and he served um, with the 2nd and 3rd Marine Divisions. And I want to tell you, I want to thank the Naval Academy. He had some very fine Marine Corps officers, graduates of this institution, took great, great care of them. So thank you. All right. Uh, another one of my kids, number three, um, uh, this is uh, Noelle. She's a lieutenant commander right now. She's actually stationed down the road at Coast Guard headquarters. Um, I'll tell you a quick story on her. When she was uh, preparing to get into the Coast Guard Academy, I started training her physically to get ready, and I trained her to the men's standard. And she discovered a month before the PT test that I was training her to the men's standard, and she got mad at me, and she said, Dad, I could have been training to the women's standard. So I said, honey, when uh, you're in the middle of a hurricane, Mother Nature won't care what your gender is. And sure enough, a couple years later, she was actually in a hurricane, a Cat 1, and she told the crew that story. So she ended up being a top military grad, and she was offered an exchange to West Point or the Naval Academy, and she chose your fine institution. <laughs> so, so two of my kids have a connection to you all, and I want to thank you. Uh, she still regrets that she didn't go the route of her old man, but her excuse was, Dad, everybody's miserable at West Point. So <laughs> she had a better time with you all. Thank you. Okay, let's get uh, started. I'm going to tell you three things we're going to do today, all right? Um, I'm going to give you a kind of an understanding of resiliency um, between what's required in an acute crisis versus a chronic crisis. So I'm going to talk to you about the difference in the kind of resiliency to consider having. I'm going to take you through a uh, real-world situation. So after I got out of the service, I, I served in peacetime. Um, I did not have any combat experience, but my uh, corporate experience was what Jason, I think, told you the first day. I was the guy volunteering for all those hard assignments and then regretting it each time because they were very hard. 
So today I'm going to take you through the second worst uh, crisis situation I've handled in my career, and you're going to vote and help decide what I should have done in that situation. And then I'm going to ask you to reflect on your own readiness to do your duty. And I'm, I'm using the word duty because I'd like you to think of duty as the highest form of love you can have as a professional. Um, it's a love of country. It's a love of your people. And uh, in the Goodwill Leader model, you'll see when my book comes out, the definition of love is to will the true good for another. So as professionals, when you think of duty, I'd like you to consider that as a high form of love, okay? And so at the end, we'll reflect on it. All right, to get started, everybody, if you're logged in, and uh, let's, let's test our polling here. If you need some devices, come on up, grab them. There's, a, there's about 25 or 30 up here. And let's get started. Okay, so identify yourself, all right? So the, you'll see the chart should start to pop up here. There you go. Now, if you're dialing in, when you press the button, it should be blue. Okay, it should be blue. If you press it again, it'll go off. It'll, it'll, it'll decline. So, all right, we're getting up over 100. See how it went down? There we go. So let's get everybody in. We'll move it along. And the reason I'm doing some of these demographic questions is so that you, um, you, we can do some dynamic slicing and see what the subgroups see, um, chose as we go through the presentation today. Okay? All right, so a few more, uh, let me give you a few more seconds. Everybody get in. The devices, uh, these hard devices will respond right away. And you can switch your answer at any time. Okay? And the last response is the one that'll occur. So we're not in Chicago where they vote early and often, just one vote, okay? All right, ready to go? All right, I'm gonna close the polling. There we go, there's our split, and we'll be, uh, you can shout out if you wanna see a dynamic split along these categories, and we'll go from there, so. All right, next one. In my family constellation, what are you considered? So firstborn or only child, choose one. Um, last born, choose three. And somewhere in the middle of the pack, choose two. If you came from a blended family, Choose what it felt like, okay? And you'll see it's, it's adapting here. Now, the remainder of the slides after this, I am not going to show the polling occurring. I just want you to see, see it occurring up there. Okay, we're up to about 166, 167. So here, I'll close the polling. And just so you can see, I'm gonna move this. I've got a little toolbar you'll see that I'll be using. I don't know if you can see that toolbar. You see that right there? So I'll be using that toolbar to slice the data, but I can see it better from over here. And so here's an example of your live numbers. You can see the numbers showing up there, 80, 37, 49. So we got a nice distribution. This will be the second group we're splitting. Now, in your training as leaders, I, I'm going to encourage you to look at family systems theory. Uh, go to Dr. Murray Bowen at Georgetown University. He was a combat surgeon during uh, World War II, went into psychiatry. And he noticed that family systems, your birth order and other dynamics, affected how people related to situations. So you might find that helpful. In my work with clients, I work with a lot of Fortune 50 and Fortune 500 companies, but the sweet spot is these middle market, privately held companies. And there's a lot of multi-generational estrangement. You'll find with uh, your crew and your troops that uh, they're suffering through estrangement too, intra-family estrangement, multi-generational estrangement, and Dr. Murray Bone's work will give you some insight in uh, you know, how to address that. Okay, let's move along. All right, so first question for you. After listening to all the speakers the last, you know, the last few days and engaging in all the breakout sessions you had, which area do, do you possess greater resiliency? Now, physical resiliency would mean, hey, I can you know, I can, I can handle, um, you know, tough runs or, or the physical demands. Mental and spiritual would be, psychologically, you feel stronger. Now, we need both to be leaders, but which do you, at this point in time, feel that you're strongest at or have the greatest resiliency? And then I'm going to slice the data right after this, so let's get up to about 160 if we can. And I'll close the polling here in a few seconds. All right, going to close the polling. And, okay, mental and spiritual was vast majority of you. Um, all right, I'm going to uh, 
Here we go. We're going to slice. I'm going to just show you a quick slice of the, um, of the data so you can see how this works. It looks, my, looks like my Bluetooth has flipped off with this. So here, I'm going to uh, have to do this um, remote, but I'm going to do it by midshipman. So you'll just see the data change. Okay, everybody see that? That was midshipman. All right, here's the ROTC cadets. All right, here's the officers. And here's our civilian guests. Okay, everybody see how that slice occurred? And for some reason, Murphy showed up again this morning. So we're having trouble with the... Um, with the, um, with the mouse here. Okay, let's move along to the next one. All right, so what's a crisis? Now, we've talked about adversity and resiliency today, but I'm going to address a special type of adversity, which is a crisis, when a significant event, it's in fact, uh, I think it was Jeff uh, last night said, you know, you can't plan for a plane to come crashing into this beautiful uh, Mahan uh, Auditorium, right? There are certain things we just can't plan for. So I'd like you to think of a crisis as one of these disturbing, upsetting events that kind of breaks the mold, okay? They're difficult, they're dangerous, and they're unstable. And uh, things no longer hold together. So you'll see in the book, The Goodwill Leader, I identify three functions of a leader after we get through the definition. The third function of a leader is to unify the group. In other words, you have to hold the group together. So that lack of unity, crisis situations are either breaking the group or threaten the unity of it, okay? All right, so let's uh, take a quick poll here. Um, let's see if the, okay, there we go. So go ahead, to what extent have you had, uh, have you experienced a significant crisis in your life? Go ahead and vote. Okay, I'm going to close the polling. We're up to about a, there we go. Okay, the 44% of you, the biggest plurality, some extent. And then we got 20% very little, significant extent, 23%, and 13% great extent. So here, I'm going to, again, my polar, uh, or my mouse just um, died, but I'm going to do, uh, let's do this by firstborns here, just to have a little bit of fun. Okay, there's the firstborns. There's the last borns. I'm gonna, let me reset it, and I'm gonna do it by, um, by your identity. Let's look at the officers first. Okay, notice the shift to the right there, right? <laughs> Life experiences, okay. And let's look at uh, our midshipmen. All right, here's Ratsy. everybody see that? And here's our midshipmen. And then here's our civilians. Okay, everybody see the split there? So. I'll, I'll have this data published when we're done, and then I'm resetting it. There's the original data, okay? All right. So let me give you the vital signs on this um, company. I had uh, um, been running um, a business in Mexico and the U.S. for Ray-Ban sunglasses. If you remember the movie Men in Black, I mean, the, the older folks in the audience might, but um, that movie nearly killed my career. I was making all the sunglasses. And um, so I'd come out of Mexico, was running Ray-Bans, North American Ops, about 2,000 people. And we had sold it off to Luxottica, which uh, owns LensCrafter. I had moved the business to Italy, and uh, this was my next assignment. So I was hired to turn around this business, okay? So these are the vital signs on the company when I walked in. $100 million business, today's dollars would probably be about 150 plus. 55% owned by family, a great family, uh, Bill Coffey was the founder. Um, he had actually built this company out of a, a destructive uh, fire that B.F. Goodrich had had, and he had recapitalized it. Uh, private equity group was out of Wall Street. They would uh, invest in these businesses. They take a majority voting rights, but a minority position. So they had control, and they brought board discipline to uh, the business. All right. Next, um, we had five locations, California, France, Main plant in Connecticut, about a 300,000 square foot building. Big, big operation in Florida, and then we owned a hotel in the Bahamas that we sold off. It was, it was a problem with that one. 
about 500 employees across all those operations. Primary products, uh, rubber-based latex foam. So if you're familiar with those cosmetic sponge pads, very fine, okay, that's, we made those, pillows and mattresses. Um, high density, wonderful product, best sleep you'll ever get. In fact, our pro bono activity uh, that uh, we would do as our, all the employees would participate in was donating these pillows and mattresses to homeless shelters um, throughout the state because, believe it or not, most homeless people have, are suffering from various mental and spiritual problems and they would get a much better sleep and that would help with their healing process. So that was our kind of give back project that we were doing. Um, great group of employees we had. And then uh, my role, I was brought in, uh, first I was brought in the division president uh, for the bedding division. Uh, four or five months after I got there, I had discovered the, the CEO was engaging in activities that were less than honorable. And so um, he, was, um, he wasn't happy with me. Um, the board was, had to made it, make a decision and they ended up removing him, promoting me to number two. And my colleague who was running the Florida business was promoted as CEO, Steve Russo. Great guy, and we became the team that was involved in turning around this business. All right, so here, just real quick on some of the stats with this chronic crisis I walked into. Um, uh, it's a turnaround situation. Cash to cash cycle was upside down. So just think of your own uh, checkbook. You've got less money coming in and more money going out. So making payroll was, was really tough. Lack of cost controls. Uh, they didn't know what they were spending, or when they were spending, no one was kind of controlling the decision-making. Uh, lack of execution. Good people, bad leadership equals bad execution. Good business model, though. They had a very good product, uh, bad approach to the market. We had to kind of re-look re at that. And so the first thing I did, and I'd like you to think about this, is when you go into situations, and you'll find this, you'll go into, um, you'll go into operations where the, the maintenance of a ship, for example, was neglected or... or um, you know, at least in the Army, you know, there were units where the Abrams vehicle or the tanks weren't properly um, uh, managed, and you really got to get into the guts of the thing to understand what's going on. So my practice, and I still do this even though I'm in, even though I'm in my mid-60s, when I show up to coach a senior executive or a plant manager, um, I want to see if they're going to wake up early, be in there to greet the employees. And in this particular case, we had a first a three-shift operation, so my rule was 645 in there, greet, greet the team. And you should have that, I wouldn't tell you, to build resiliency is get to know your people. And you heard that throughout, throughout our discussion over the last three days. Um, I, in particular, had a set of operational excellence priorities, and I actually teach this through our Goodwill Leader Model. Safety was first, quality was second, delivery or on-time delivery third, and flexibility, which meant produce the product or service at the lowest marginal cost possible. So uh, started that out. And then performance measures, know your numbers, okay? Had to know your numbers. And my rule with the leaders I coach and with the leaders I led was if you didn't know it up here, the big numbers, you didn't know your business. And I would suggest to you, the more you know those numbers, you're gonna actually have elasticity because you'll be able to think between the narrative and the numbers. You'll be able to pull those together, okay? So just quick introduction to the vital signs that were going on. Okay, so, um, May 14th, that's a Monday, 9.15 in the morning, acute crisis hits. We have a uh, fire in our curing oven. I'm gonna show you where this curing oven was. 250 employees are evacuated on the first shift. 80 of those employees were older ladies who had um, you know, tactile ability to handle small cosmetic kits. We're on the second floor and uh, I usually ran uh, fire drills and other things like that once a month, so orderly exit of the facility. There's smoke in the building, and um, this is a high bay, and I'm gonna show you this in a minute. And so the question we're gonna, I'm gonna pull you on is, should you return the employees to the building? Now, and if anybody wants to jump up to the microphone, we'll do a quick dialogue on this. Let me show you where the curing ovens were. This is, uh, I'm kinda honed in on the facility, but. If you can see that red square, those were the big curing ovens, 300,000 square foot building, main plant, and uh, here's, here's what the overall plant looked like, if you can see it there. Okay, so all the employees are evacuated out to this parking lot. Uh, the firefighters have gone in here, a combination of uh, 
volunteers and professionals. They put out the fire. You're out here, and I'm out. I'm um, Steve, my boss, was down in Florida, so he was flying up to meet with me that week. And I give him a call, and, I, and he was on his plane, on the plane. And I said, Steve, I had a fire. Fire departments put it out, and um, we're you know we're trying to assess what to do next. All right, so my question to you is, what would you choose to do, okay? You've got everybody outside, building safe. Uh, firefighters have told you that they've put out the fire. What would you do? So let's vote, okay? And remember, you're upside down on cash flow. Your CFO has told you that, you know, if we don't get back in there, you're gonna lose $50,000 in lost absorption. So if any of you have got some of the financial background and there's various accounting methods, um, absorption is a way we do it in manufacturing, is you absorb money by producing product, okay? So go ahead, just, you know, based on what you've heard, what would you choose to do? Return the employees to the plant to assist with clearing the smoke and the opening the windows. Now remember, these, these were tough, hardworking people. They were not wilting flowers. Uh, in fact, some of the maintenance guys looked like Popeye. Big, hardy guys, and they're tough, okay? Um, but you have a mix of employees, right? Those ladies, most of them ladies working up in the cosmetic section are um, you know, having trouble walking, so you got a very broad mix of employees. Or number two, do you dismiss the employees and clear the facility, but you're gonna lose money? Does everybody see the conflict here? Okay. All right, we're up to 163. Let's close the polling and see what you chose. All right, 78% of you said dismiss. Tell me why. Let's go, somebody jump up the microphone. Give me a quick insight into why you chose that. Or if you chose the other one. Go ahead, sir. Sir, it's in line with your operational excellence priorities. Okay, but um, let me ask you, the fire department, uh, the volunteer firefighter came out and told you the fire's out. And that, you know, fires in this business occur periodically. So why wouldn't you, you know, safety's first priority, I get it, but that's kind of an overarching thing, right? You have to you're also going to run out of cash. Everybody get that? So be a little more precise if you can. Sir, uh, I voted for number two, dismiss. Um, but I think if you're talking about different types of employees, is there any way you could mix that, uh, mix these two decisions? Why couldn't we, you know, send some of the hardier employees back in? But you know, you're talking about some of the older people who might be a little less equipped. They could be dismissed for their safety. Okay. So remember, if production's not running, you're not producing cash. If you're not producing cash, what's going to happen? There's two types of philosophers in life. There's philosophers, and you have some good ones here, and there's bankers. <laughs> bankers are realists, right? And they have loan covenants. So remember, you're in a really tough situation. Go ahead, though, but good answer. Hi, I'm a midshipman at the Merchant Marine Academy. Very good. And we spend a lot of time out at sea, and something like this is what we talk about quite often at our school. And we talk about, is it more important to make money for the ship, or is it more important to, for the safety of the crew and make safe decisions? And I decided to choose to dismiss the crew because ultimately what's more important is the safety of all the people. It doesn't matter if they're more hardy or not. You have to check. There might be a reflash of fire. You have to check and guarantee with the firefighters that the entire building is safe. And if it's not guaranteed safe, then you shouldn't put so, your employees back. So um, if you have a, and I'm assuming on those big ships, you periodically have fires or problems. Yes. If your maintenance experts tell you that the fire's out, how have you been trained to respond? If the fire's out and there's absolutely a guarantee that there will be no reflash fire, then you proceed work. Okay, very good. Over here, thank you. I just kind of was thinking about the COVID situation and how you want to build loyalty with your employees by making sure that they understand that you care about them. And so a situation like this saying, oh, it might not be safe. I mean, there's still smoke in the area. Your employees want you to know, want to know that you have their best interest in mind and that if your company overall is suffering, you want employees who are gonna be like, you know, digging their heels into the ground and wanna stick around. Okay. Now remember, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you something that is part of the cold hard reality that your commanders have to deal with is, you can feel good and go out of business. You see that tension? 
Okay, so the heart can be kind of terrified, but the mind has to think with this kind of cold, penetrating reality of, okay, what's the second and third order effects of this decision? So good, good point, though. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, sir, I think that there are also external factors. Um, I, I agreed with the last person as far as culture uh, within the company, but I think taking something like this, you know, because you're strapped on cash, uh, making a decision like this, you know, instead of taking one day off for these workers, I mean, it even opens you up to public relations issues. It, it, it can cause a whole new range of problems trying to take a shortcut. Okay, very good point. Final comment. Very good, sir. Thank you. So I chose the second one, dismiss the employees, just because uh, in terms of uh, kind of economics, if you think about it, losing $50,000 worth of production is a lot cheaper than getting sued by your employees for injuries, injuries related to smoke inhalation, which okay. could be a factor. Okay, so I'm going to summarize with this. The, when I was outside in that circle and I was asking everybody, what do you think we ought to do? The, the key leaders are saying, hey, Pete, we've dealt with this five years ago or 10 years ago. And here's what we would go through. And so as I listened, and I listened to the firefighters, I chose to dismiss the employees. But here's why. And this is the lesson in resiliency I want you to take away is. I did not have confidence that those firefighters, as young and as energetic as they were, understood the complexity of my operation. So my decision was, I'm not sure that you have the level of expertise to understand the chemical process we have going on here, and just to be double safe. So if, if I had trusted their expertise, I probably would have gone back in. Everybody got it? All right, so I took a small crew back into the operation. Okay, so, um, okay, I took everybody, uh, they're starting to dismiss the employees, took the group back in here, firefighters are wrapping up their hose, and out of the oven comes this spark. Just imagine this kind of arc. And that was my building. Within, within an hour and a half, um, the heat just kind of resonated through. So we had this Kanban set, system set up, and you probably have cer certain type of logistics framework set up in your own, you know, uh, the list exchange for the Navy or the Marine Corps. And, um, it just went through. I, it was unbelievable how fast. And I've been around, you know, in training, I thought I had, I had experienced, you know, just, just in training, like out in the Mojave Desert at uh, Fort Irwin, we would do rolling thunder, and, you know, I'm sitting there with my M16 going, you know, just, holy cow, you know. It was, uh, and I'm sure some of the, the officers here have seen just the kinetic power. I'd never seen anything like this. I'd never seen fire. You couldn't get, you couldn't get close. So, uh, here's what's going on. The fire's intense, and the first thing going through my mind is I'm panicked because I can't find all my employees. So when that fire went off, it was like a flash. The ambient temperature was up. And so I ran around the building twice trying to count heads. And as try as I made to get close to that fire, you couldn't. It was that fast. It was remarkable. Um, the city of Ansonia, Connecticut was in absolute panic. Um, it was literally a panic situation. And my boss, Steve, calls me. He just landed at the Hartford Airport 50 miles away. He says, Pete, what's the situation? I go, Steve, it's not good. Just had a second fire. Um, Steve had a kind of a colorful character, um, great guy. But you know, some of the adjectives would pop in. What do you mean, not good? And I said, Steve, uh, where are you? He's in the car driving down. I said, look up in the air. And the two-mile plume had already formed. That's how intense this was. And my wife was up the hill with, um, with our kids. She was up the hill. See that Houstonic River over there? And the dentist said to her, hey, Debbie, uh, doesn't, isn't your husband's factory over there? It's um, on fire. So here, a couple quick clips from the, uh, just a couple quick clips. Call Fox 61 News at 10 begins right now. massive dark plume of danger. There was a hell on earth. I mean, fire and smoke. Okay, um, we were on CNN. I, I won't play all these clips. CNN had us on. Um, 
they uh, they interviewed me. Here's a quick just now. 240 employees are out of jobs. Our main concern is that um, that our, everybody's safe. Company leaders say this looked like a minor incident when it all started around 9:30 this morning. They say firefighters brought a small fire under control, but then within an hour it erupted again. It started in an oven used to dry the foam products. Firefighters said it was out. Then later spotted more flames in the roof. But the second eruption spread quickly. The sprinkler system was overwhelmed. Fire Firefighters can't yet say whether they missed something the first time around. It's been real difficult today seeing what the heavy winds we have, and, and she's just taken off from there with, uh, as far as the control of the fire. Carmen Desenzo watched as firefighters shot water from the roof of his clothing store. This morning was very, very scary. The flames were shooting so high, it was just right over the top of our building. Company leaders insist any burning chemicals in those flames and smoke are non-toxic. Uh, you can see the Black Hawk helicopter. Black Hawk helicopters, by the way, had come out about eight years earlier, and the uh, Governor Roland flew in. I won't play that clip. Um, here, let me just. Now, okay, that's what. Um, that's all melted steel right there. That's not wood. That's actually melted steel, and that's what uh, the site looked like. All right. So, the acute. Would you agree that was a kind of an acute crisis situation? Okay, and now um, I discover, there's a few things I discover here, so as we go through this, so let me just take you to the, so this is immediately after the acute situation. Here's what I learned, okay, communicate, 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 but be careful with the media. So I was, um, I was assigned the point person, uh, Steve, Steve, my boss actually, had a really hard time initially with this. When he showed up, he literally, he was, he was shaking, it was, he was really struggling. Later on, it was Steve who carried me, and I'll explain that, okay? Um, first thing I learned, communicate, 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 but be careful what you tell the media, okay? Um, they are not your friend, okay? Trust your public relations people here, okay? Jeff, for example, was one of the experts uh, yesterday, all right? You gotta be careful. Second thing that happened was, um, the press started asking me if we were gonna sue the fire department. Isn't that interesting? They already went to a litigus mine. We shut that down. We just absolutely shut it down. Um, you know, the, uh, the lawyers came out of everywhere wanting to, to sue the fire department. We shut it down, and we never did do anything against the fire department, okay? They were just doing the best they could. Okay, um, my initial priority was safety, and that included community, so I had to go up in the Black Hawk helicopter, and other, um, you know, police had me, and we were going around just checking, and. Um, I had uh, some of my um, chemical engineers with me. Um, I called in uh, ministers, rabbis, priests, psychologists, um, all the folks to help because remember, these were working class people and they had just watched their jobs evaporate. And, and at this time, we didn't have a lot of public assistance going on. So these people are really struggling. Okay, and you'll see this in, you know, with your sailors and Marines. A lot of them are struggling financially. They've made poor decisions and uh, that debt burden can, can be hard on them, okay? And then secure, I had to make sure we secured the site. Uh, we had people going into this site. I even had one of the owners was so upset, um, we had to drag him out of the building. I had to go into the building and drag him out, it was that unstable. So people will react differently in these crisis situations. So um, that's just an example of what happened. All right, now, I'm gonna ask you what would you do and uh, in this particular situation. So next polling question's coming up, okay? Scotty was my third shift supervisor, so once a week I would go in at three o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, and Scotty ran the whole factory on third shift. Um, and I want you just to listen to a little video clip of Scotty, okay? This is, he's just one of the salt of the earth guys. Okay, here, go ahead and listen to this. The devastation of today's fire is not unfamiliar to one man who's worked at the Latex Phone Company for 24 years. He lived through the fire that destroyed the BF Goodrich factory in Shelton 25 years ago. Fox 61's Tom Mischuk talked with Scotty Martin as the smoke filled the sky today in Ansonia. Today was the second time Scotty Martin watched the place he worked burn to the ground. Well, you gotta have a strong back. You gotta have faith. Fire destroyed the Latex Foam Company in Ansonia, the place Scotty had worked for 24 years. Before that, Scotty worked at BF Goodrich in Shelton for 23 years until fire destroyed that place in 1975. Today, Scotty says he met with eight of the 17 workers he supervises, and they were, well, just like Scotty was once. 
devastating. 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 Some boys were worried about, uh, like I said, they just bought homes. One of them was my team leader down here at 311, Seth. Just has a new baby. 25 years ago, Scotty and his wife Joan had just bought a home too and were expecting a baby. He says the state provided unemployment and food stamps, and eventually, somehow, latex foam was born from the ashes of the BF Goodrich fire. Tonight, 66 year old Scotty Martin still has what he had back then hope. And I just hope that uh, I know we have a building back there on the other side of this building that is probably still intact. Maybe. Uh, we could start back off there like we did in Shelton, you know, four or five presses, get it going, get what we need to run, and rebuild again because it's a thriving business and we make the best. We make the best product. Wouldn't you love to have a guy like that working for you? Yeah. Wonderful human being. Okay. So here's, I'm going to ask you to poll now. What would you do? Okay. You're, you're in the middle of the rebuild now. Now you're in the chronic phase. By the way, you discover that you're underinsured by $10 million. Your CFO has failed to fully insure the business correctly. You're going to discover these things. You walk into these situations and you don't know, right? So now it's really stressed and your staff has told you, Pete, we don't need Scotty right now. You know, he just doesn't have the technical thing. Cash flow is very tight. So you're, you're trying to make payroll every month, right? All right, so what would you choose to do? I want you to vote, okay? Would you uh, have Steve, uh, Scotty come back to work? or would you follow your staff's advice? Okay, go ahead. So here, polling's open. There we go. All right, go ahead and vote. One, accept your staff's position, or two, return Scotty to work. Now, um, you know, when I would go in and meet with Scotty and we'd walk around the operation, of course I got to know Scotty, and this, several of your speakers brought this up, know your people, and I knew Scotty, you know, he's 66 years old, hard working man. He's worked his whole life, um, and he's had some trouble with his kids. Um, one of them had gone to prison. Wonderful man, and so, you know, parents sometimes do the best they can, but uh, we're all free, free human beings, right? And you've probably experienced this in your own family life. So Scotty was having trouble, and I was worried about him. I knew him, I, and I was worried. My gut was telling me I was worried about Scotty. So what well, would you do? Just, just listening to the, to the scenario? Okay, let's close the polling. Okay, well, you guys are a good sympathetic audience. <laughs> All right. Um, I accepted my staff's recommendation because the numbers told me we couldn't afford Scotty. Um, two weeks later, we found Scotty and hung himself. And I think for 10 years, I carried the guilt of not following my gut, meaning... Um, all the numbers, all the logic said, can't afford him. And yet, my gut was telling me, bring Scotty back, because I knew Scotty. I share this with you because, for me, that was a near breaking point, because Scotty had clearly broke, would you agree? Okay. Um, it was an awful situation. And, of course, I had lost, it, I had lost employees in factories, because, you know, older folks, they got cardiac problems. So when an employee dies on the job, you don't come to work to die, right? So these crisis situations, this caused a lot of agony for everybody, okay? Now, I want to go back to something here real quick and um, tell you something else that was going on, all right? 9-11 um, attacks have occurred. So uh, in my neighborhood, I had people working in the city, some in the towers. So now the Connecticut community had lost people in the, in the tower attack. And then in my neighborhood, or in my uh, town of Oxford, we actually lost a lady to the anthrax attack. So many of you don't remember that, but I remember coming home and telling Debbie, don't open the mail, and she'd say, oh, really, are you sure? Boy, after, after, we, lost, um, after we lost the neighbor to the anthrax attack, you could tell, right? It's chronic, you can feel the pressure building, and. Um, you know, a lot of panic around everybody at the time. So Scotty's death really hurt everybody. Okay. All right, so um, we still have to figure out what to do. The board is in conflict now. Family members are becoming risk averse. So if any of you have any corporate finance uh, background, you'll know that in businesses, managers tend to be risk averse. 
And when people go through crisis like that, they pull back. They pull back and they really begin to kind of count their pennies. Um, the private equity guys were um, more steely-eyed. They were kind of looking at the business. And so um, I'm having to navigate between people that want to cash out. Um, Steve became brilliant at this point. He, um, he was really, uh, really able to negotiate the family uh, board dynamics. Um, as I told you, the insurance proceeds are low and people want to cash out. So what do you do? What do you do in these situations, right? Um, well, the first thing I did was, um, was uh, I went back on the news to, because um, a lot of questions were coming up about what are you, what are you gonna do? And I studied a fire that occurred in the Malden Mills in 1995. Okay, very famous fire. Here's a quick clip of me responding to the media. And by the way, I'd been spanked by the board for communicating too much. So this was my response now, uh, much more sober response to the media. How is the company able to provide salary continuation benefits and how much do you estimate the company will pay out to all of your employees? Well, we borrowed um, in advance of what we hope will be insurance money proceedings back to the company. But we felt it was a priority to take care of our employees who have been very loyal to us. And um, so that's basically how we made it work. Yeah, and how much do you estimate you will pay out to employees? It would probably be over a million dollars in salary continuation benefits when all is said and done. Mm -hmm. One last question. What is the future of Latex Foam, a, con a temporary site here in Ansonia and ultimately? Well, we're working all options. Uh, we clearly hope we can rebuild, but we've got a lot of due diligence to go through now. Uh, our priority was to take care of the public health and safety issues. We've done that, uh, work with our employees and make sure that they uh, get all the job assistance they need in a transition. Now we enter the new phase, which is assessing our company's future. Okay, so um, the board tasked me with trying to figure out how to resolve this. Steve was kind of working the politics of the board. Um, they still had me communicating. And what do you do in this situation where you got a conflict? The group is now divided. Fiefdoms have formed. You've got to hold the group together. And you know this is a good business, what do you do? Well, I went out and studied the Malden Mills fire, and Aaron Feinstein was the um, owner of this uh, business. And just about this time, I was getting intel that Malden Mills was um, struggling financially, even though uh, Aaron had been very generous to the employees. Uh, half my board did not want to pay the employees. All right? They said, hey, we're underinsured by $10 million. I was able to convince them that we could pay out a million dollars in salary continuation, and survive, avoid what actually happened to Malden Mills was they went twice and eventually bankrupt. Because there's a moral problem with taking other people's money and not paying them back. Would you agree? Okay. So what did I do? Well, we studied. So when you're in a crisis, study what others have done. Be a student, okay? You've got time, usually, all right? Um, second, know your numbers. I told you about that, right? and you'll, you'll hear about this from your commanders, is su study the second and third order effects of decision making. Malden Mills got all sorts of ethics awards for being generous to their employees, but they went out of business. So that's that feel good versus the hard cold reality, right? Um, General Colin Powell, one of my favorite generals, he, uh, he said, you know, don't be buffaloed by experts and, and elites. Experts often possess more data than judgment. When I'm coaching leaders, especially CEOs, I remind them, you are the expert of the whole, okay? They're the expert of a part. You have to make a decision. Listen to them, but you have to bring it all together. Um, I was out on the Coast Guard ship, the Harriet Lane, and the, the captain of this ship, it's only, I think, about 280-foot um, boat, and I had slept down with the crew, which was an amazing experience, and I watched him, that captain, uh, Coast Guard Academy grad, MIT grad, he knew that ship cold. It was absolutely impressive. Know your whole, whatever you're responsible for, know the whole and the part-whole relationships. If you don't know it, you can't lead it. And believe it or not, it's more than the people. You've got to know the technology and all the other stuff that makes that whole ship work. Okay? All right, so I, uh, though, brought in an expert. I uh, was a late I got out of the Army in um, 28, 29. I went into the reserves after that, I had a couple of company commands. And so I had to catch up. I went and got my MBA a little bit later. And um, I had also gone back to school several times. 
So for those of you who are struggling at the Naval Academy, I'm just going to raise my hand and tell you a little resiliency test. Uh, at West Point, I flunked stats. And I had to go to summer school. And it was humiliating because back then you could graduate with a 1.0. You didn't have to have a 2. My roommate, Archie Davis, had a 1.3. Wonderful guy, 30-year vet, hell of a warrior. Um, so anyway, there were a bunch of us in, um, in uh, summer school. And later on, I was so ashamed of my um, slothfulness, of not fighting through it, that I went and got a master's in stats. How's that for penance? Huh? So anyway, then I, when I went in and got my corporate finance degree, an MBA, um, I had really become very good at looking at the numbers, using the leadership. And so I brought in Dr. Leslie Marks, who was, my, um, was one of my professors, to help me. And we built a model. And I'm just going to show you this quickly. For those of you in operations research, Okay, uh, we went through and built a model. Um, we took a spreadsheet, put in all the parameters. And then um, I put together a stochastic model. Uh, Dr. Marks was fantastic with this, where we actually assessed the risk reward of all of our decision making and then brought it back. And I was able to go to the board and let the board adjust the variables in the model as we were working through this crisis, and they decided to rebuild. So just quickly showing you this. And you know, these were some of, for those of you who are familiar with uh, corporate finance, there's a weighted average cost of capital where you're taking your debt and your, um, your equity and using that to determine your, you know, thresholds for reinvestment. OK, so these are just quick. I just want you to know, OK, you're learning these tools. You've got to use them later because you're, you're managing complex technology. Even back then, OK, this stuff works. And leaders have to know the narrative and the numbers to command, right? So um, here's what I'd like to kind of close with, and then I'll take your questions, all right? Um, assess your own readiness for resiliency. I will tell you that uh, when I was a young soldier, I was enlisted before I went to West Point, and um, I went and I was scared to death that I couldn't handle blood on the battlefield. I literally was scared to death of it. So I, uh, for my own resiliency, I uh, went and watched autopsies at 19 years old because I had a tremendous fear that I couldn't handle blood. And so that helped me kind of get used to the fact. And then later on, I was a first responder in numerous uh, fatalities and near-death experiences, and that working through my fear helped. Same thing, when, uh, when I was in Airborne, I can still remember my legs shaking uncontrollably on that first jump out of a C-130. Later on, I you know, was a pathfinder and then actually did skydiving for fun. So you, know, we have to, you have to work through it. You have to push yourself, be around really competent people to help you through it. Um, I had two malfunctions. Each malfunction I had, I can still remember the Vietnam veteran. You could, you could see I'm kind of standing in a shell shock, get me right back up on the helicopter of the plane, get me out so I work through the fear. So um, I had to struggle through a lot of fears in my life, and you'll have to struggle through your own fears. Understand the second and third order effects. Um, had I let those employees back in the building, I would have lost probably 50 or 60 souls. Would you agree? Those old ladies getting up there, trying to do their work. They're shuffling back out would have been unbelievably terrible. So I had a lot of gratitude that this crisis had no loss of life. Um, I would tell you, start training now. Little resiliency thing would be self-denial, OK? You know, uh, work through. Um, you, our culture is so addicted to pleasure that we don't even know how addicted we are, OK? Put those phones aside periodically. Do a technology fast, OK? Um, it's, it's a sad uh, effect of technology, but it is weakening our souls, all right? Know your limits physically and morally. I think we have a crisis of limits in this country, OK? Many are people you can push them to the limit they don't know they have, but leaders don't know the limits of their organization. So know the real limits, OK? So even if they feel safe, they may not be safe, OK? So you know, using that thinking skills to understand. It's very important to educate the emotions, but as leaders, you have to have kind of a cold, hard look at reality. And I'm a big believer that if it wasn't for the relationships, if it wasn't for Steve and all sorts of friends who helped me throughout my career, I would not, I, I just wouldn't have made it. Okay, I, I gathered strength from having relationships with people that would suffer with me. And you'll experience that too. Okay? Those are your true friends. Okay? And then finally, um, you know, I'm a big believer in mission first, people always. You've got to find the sweet spot. Uh, duty is a high form of love, and uh, sometimes it's going to require sacrifice. 
And if you're willing to make that sacrifice, others will sacrifice with you. Same thing happened here. We gave up salary. We gave up bonuses. The community knew we were in there, and not just, we didn't make it just about the money. All right? So let me close off with um, just uh, this summary, and then let me take your questions. Um, for me, two, two near breaking points. Um, the death of Scotty uh, was just bone crushing. Uh, Steve was the guy picking me up. Um, uh, the rebuild was exhausting. Uh, I worked six and a half days a week. Uh, the only time I took off was mass on Sunday morning, and I was gone. My, my wife uh, has been a widow many times. Or I'm sorry, yeah, I guess uh, I, where I was gone uh, for many months, and this one, she barely saw me for over a year as we rebuilt the business and got it in place. Had two more fires during the rebuild. I fired my uh, environmental health and safety officer. He was very angry at me for five years, called me one day, and we kind of reconciled. You're going to make tough calls. Um, I was ruthless about safety after that because we just couldn't have it, right? Uh, but good guy, he just made mistakes, and you're going to have that happen. Um, and then, of course, September 11th was tragic for all of us, and I would say this crisis uh, was the second worst I had to handle in my career. Uh, the worst was I was in Mexico, um, very chronic Mexican mafia infiltration in my business. I had... Um, uh, undercover agents, all sorts of stuff. It was nasty. Uh, this one's more kinetic. That one was actually uh, tougher. I learned a lot, but my gratitude remains. No lives were lost. And I think you all have that same aptitude. So thank you. Let's take questions. And I hope, I hope that was helpful to you today. Okay. So go ahead, line up. Line up here if you have any questions or concerns about my decision making. Feel free to criticize. I tell folks the only person who can hurt my feelings is my wife. Okay? All right. Any questions? Go ahead, sir. Uh, good morning, sir. Mitchman Bechet, University of Pennsylvania. Oh, I was wondering, um, did you feel at all that your training in the Army helped you throughout your time as uh, C COO, was it? Yeah, uh, President, COO, CEO, yeah. And yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say yes, it helped. But I will tell you this. Um, I coach a lot of my classmates who are exiting. And um, I, I will tell you this. I was excessively idealistic. Um, I had to adjust my standards without losing my integrity. So I would say um, for those of you who are perhaps like me, where you're idealistic and then you're, ideal, you're defeated by your ideals and you become a cynic, that's how I define a cynic, is a defeated idealist, okay? Is um, reality's messy. You're gonna have to deal with gradients of good. Our culture is kind of has a Manichaeism to it, which is an ancient heresy of pure evil, pure goodness. And I would tell you, um, yes, it helped, but it's insufficient. I did not understand how a business worked. So the struggle I had was you could be all the rah-rah, you know, that, that's, the nature of a business is different than the nature of the military. So yes, it'll help you, but work through those struggles and fears while you're young because there's going to be bigger ones coming as you climb the ladder. And your commanders will tell you that. They'll tell you that. So good, great question. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. Michigan, third class, Reyes, Naval Academy. My question comes from, you have a good-natured employee, a member of your team who means well with intent, but you mentioned there comes a point where you have this objective that you're trying to achieve, and you know, they're not really cutting it. And that like, really sparked curiosity with me, because I'm like, you know, I feel a lot of empathy towards people, but well, how do you deal with that situation when it comes to that point? Yeah, I'm a little bit counterculture on, there, there's too much emphasis on empathy nowadays. Mm -hmm. Um, I think empathy is improperly defined. Empathy should be that you understand, you have the perceptiveness to understand what's going on inside that person, and then choose correctly whether you acknowledge how they feel or not. Some people do not want you to acknowledge how they feel. They feel shame from that. So um, we can sometimes make more out of the feelings. It's, it's a judgment call. I had folks I worked with that did not want you talking about, oh, I understand how you feel. They weren't interested in that. What they wanted to know was, were you authentic? Were you telling me how I did? Most of the performance problems with people with good intent but bad execution was, 
No one was sitting them down and breaking down the part whole relationships and showing them here's where the gaps are. It was always this, you're not cutting it. It was very generic. Leaders have to communicate and you gotta take the time to show people. Most people that I've seen terminated complain to me, no one ever told me the reality of what was going on. And so everybody feels good until they don't. And it's usually higher up says, you gotta cut. And then they're doing it well, the boss says it. When in fact, the other N word I like to use, negligence. You failed to do your duty, right? You neglected to do your duty to that person and tell them the truth in a compassionate way, appropriate to their maturity, but that's, that's how I would encourage you to reconcile the good intention, bad execution, okay? Communicate. Thank you, sir. Yep. Yes, ma'am. And then I'll come over here, okay? Good morning. Um, first, I just want to thank you so much for um, the way that you presented. I think it really allowed us to empathize with, you know, the what you were thinking throughout um, the crises that you experienced, and it was really, like, effective for for I think, I think all of us, it was a really awesome presentation. Um, my question for you is uh, one of the things that you recommended for us to build resiliency that really stuck with me um, is to put yourself to the test in less extreme situations to kind of prepare for when those situations can and will be more extreme. Um, I just wanted to ask for your advice as to how um, that we can kind of gauge uh, to do that and just, just more examples of how you might recommend doing that. Yeah, I, I think for, um, for those of you who are going the military route, I think your commanders are going to have a good sense for, you know, how to, how to raise the bar. Um, so, you know, to me it comes down to those fundamentals you heard from other speakers, which is, you know, good discipline around sleep, good habits in eating. Um, I think the Blue Angel pilot, the young lady, uh, she was a great speaker, by the way, right, really gutsy lady. Um, she, you know, she talked about bad habits, okay. I would tell you, first thing is, um, before you put yourself to the test, ask yourself, what are you willing to deny yourself? Okay, because self-denial is really going to prepare you for suffering better than just putting yourself to extreme tests. So start with those fundamentals around your character um, and then asking yourself, will I choose the harder right or, or the easier? Um, and the cadet prayer at West Point talks about, you know, go after the whole truth um, not the half truth, when the whole truth can be won. So that's where I would start with those little tests. Those are kind of the interior battles. And then work your way up physically, uh, you know, for all those, you know, that are in the combat arms, you gotta be physically fit. Uh, I, I coach a lot of leaders that lack stamina. They just can't hang. And we're not talking about doing forced marches and crazy stuff. They just can't do the 14 hour days that are required. They get too tired. So. That's why I say is little things, don't go to these extreme things until you're ready, because then you'll break your confidence, work your way up. But I will tell you this, the Army broke me a few times, even though I was rock solid shape, um, there were a few times when it really broke me down. So you're gonna go through those tests where you find your limits. So I, I know it's in a bit of an ambiguous answer, but I would start with those interior battles first and then work out. Thank you so much, Thank sir. You. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good morning, sir. I'm in Chipman, third class hunt from the Naval Academy. My question is, a lot of the things that you described seemed immensely frustrating, and almost at some points traumatic. And my question revolves around, like, given that this was like a company that was separate to yourself, did you ever feel a longing to escape or to quit? And then how did you manage those feelings, given the situation? Yeah, that's, boy, that's a good question. Um, all right, I'm gonna tell you a story that goes back to when I was a young lieutenant. Um, my first platoon was a mechanized infantry platoon, and we had these death traps called APCs, armored personnel carriers. They weren't the Abrams, or the, um, um, the Bradley fighting vehicles. Thank you. <laughs> my Marine Corps colonel helping me out there. Um, and um, I remember I, um, I got my vehicle stuck in a swamp. And I'm out there digging with my soldiers, and I could tell they were laughing at me because I'd po chosen poorly. And for those of you who have been through the second lieutenant rite of passage, it's a it's a passage of screw ups. And this Marine, uh, I'm sorry, this Army um, or S3 Vietnam veteran, highly decorated, always smoked a cigar, comes up and he could see I was pathetic. I I'm digging, I'm sweating, and I didn't mind the heat as much. I hated the cold, but. 
he could just see I was miserable. And he looks down at me and he goes, hey, DeMarco, do you know the definition of a professional? I looked up and I, all my soldiers scurry away. They could tell it's going to take a butt chewing. And I look up, I go, no, sir, I don't. And he goes, puts a cigar in his mouth. He squats down next to me, he goes, doing something well, even when you don't like it. And I was, you could tell that I remembered that, right? And I was ashamed that my attitude was seeping through and he could see it. So I would tell you, by the, I, I had educated my emotions to the point where uh, doing my duty was very strong in my heart. Um, I wasn't the smartest guy in the room, so I had to kind of muscle my way through things to learn. I will tell you the regret I had was, I think my, my bride of now four, oh, coming up on 40 years, um, she carried a burden because I was so duty bound to taking care of my folks that raising our family, like you heard some of the, your Marine Corps officers say, is she was the rear, rear commander. So I don't think I did as well on balancing and I think I've gotten better at that. But I, I had gotten to the point where the escape thing was just, I would put it out of my mind because I remember what that major had told me, which is being a professional is doing something well even when you don't like it. Okay. Thank you for that question. Yeah, thank you, sir. Yeah. Over here, sir, and then last question there. Okay. Uh, good morning, sir. Um, my name is Ms. Shipman, fourth class, Miles Harvin. I'm from University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Hey, Miles. Um, so first of all, I'd like to say thank you for coming out and allowing us to hear Well, your thank you for having me. Um, more so the Naval Academy. <laughs> but um, my question to you is, how does one understand the second and third order effects of decisions when considering the odds of the main issue? Because I know you mentioned that, for example, your factory issue, it was kind of foggy to understand how you were going to go about things moving on for the future when you have the main issue at hand. So how does one process those second and third orders? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, here's how... Believe it or not, was my master's in stats where this kind of clicked in my head. But first, to look at what is possible, then what are the probabilities? And a lot of leaders are already counting their odds without actually looking at kind of go, no go possibilities. You follow me? Yes. Sir. So look at possibilities. And then I would tell you, you know, we're all going to have this kind of systemic risk where everybody's subjected to it. But there's a lot of risks that you can prevent. And I call this fighting the battles far from the castle wall. It's an old medieval term, which is um, you, can, you can anticipate second and third order effects by not letting decisions linger or letting things go. And the classic one I do in my ethics training is getting it right versus getting along. And majority of us, as you know, Aristotle called us social animals, will want to get along and not get it right. And leaders find that sweet spot. They know how to navigate that. So I would tell you, by fighting the battles far from the wall, you'll learn second and third order effects because you'll be able to see like the opening, you know, the, the analogy is used frequently, a chess game, but it's true. If you understand chess, you can see the second and third order effects of your decision making. And so think about it that way is, if you get right to the wall, you, you're, you're not gonna be able to think second and third order effects, right? The safety protocol I put in place in all my operations, whether in Mexico or in the US, and actually I was in, I was in China um, in uh, March or February of 2020, I was on one of the last flights out. I was over there turning around a business, and I'm telling you, this, those basics work everywhere. All human beings are united by those common goods, and so if you think about those common goods and anticipate them, you'll, you'll be thinking naturally in second and third order effects. But the, the, the first decision matters the most. So, great question. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Miles. And final question here. Hey, good morning, sir. Midshipman Fourth Class Niski from the Naval Academy. When you're looking back on a crisis, how do you deal with the fact that you, the feeling that you uh, could have possibly made a wrong decision, such as with Scotty? Um, I, I don't think I'll ever let it go. I mean, I think you, you know, you're not fully to blame, but I think every leader carries, you know, those moral injuries. You know, what is a moral injury? You heard this um, yesterday. A moral injury is nothing more than an injury to the good. I mean, we're not morally injured when we win, would you agree? Right? We're morally injured when we sin, when we uh, do something wrong, when we're unethical. And, you know, none of us is pure as the driven snow. So, you know, to me, it's, um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, take out a little journal and say, what could I have done better today? 
Who did I offend? What, what do I need to go back and apologize for? What did I do well and need to keep doing? Those are called habits of excellence, right? And you can't build up a virtue without, first of all, going through the cleansing process of, of acknowledging what you did wrong. You're going to injure relationships. Um, and, uh, you know, it's going to happen. You're going to make those mistakes, but, um, you know, good commanders will help you sort through it. And sometimes you're going to have to live with those, those um, failures. And I draw a distinction between a moral failure, which is when you do something wrong because you knew you were doing it wrong, you knew you were a coward, okay? And uh, I, 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 my biggest fear in life is being a coward, especially a moral coward, okay? So um, that should scare you, right? Second, um, a mistake is different than a moral, you know, a moral failure. A mistake is I made a right turn and I meant to make a left. So when, when my employees would tell me or, or I'm coaching somebody, they say, well, I made a mistake, I'll say, whoa, whoa. Did you, did you do wrong or did you make a left turn versus a right turn, right? So be honest with yourself. Your language is going to determine whether you're, and, and that, that's really what builds up a professional is because the profession has a standard of excellence. And it's going to be an honest struggle throughout your life if you'll engage in that honest struggle. And then find good commanders. In my case, you know, um, my, my um, faith tradition is I'm a Catholic, so, you know, I, uh, I go to confession. And uh, for you, it might be going to see a good friend or a commander and, and confessing. Confession is good for the soul. Okay, you are not the sole judge of your integrity. So that's how I would answer that. Okay, great question. And it's a hard one. So I, I don't know, I think I've forgiven myself, but I think the residue of the loss is still there. I'm sure your commanders had many of those. They've had suicides in the military that have been horrific. A lot of alienation that's affecting and you got to be alert, you know. I lost classmates to, to, um, to suicide. Uh, the number two guy in my class, Ian Cunningham, took his life uh, about five years ago. Already out of the service. Wonderful, brilliant guy. So throughout your life, you got to keep your eye on your friends. Take care of them. Thank you. Very good Thank question. Thank you, sir. Okay. Dr. DeMarco, on behalf of the Naval Academy Leadership Conference, I'd like to thank you for your vulnerability, your wisdom, and for joining us to share this experience with us this year. So on behalf of us, we'd like to present you with this gift. Thank you. Thank you. You did a wonderful thank job. You so So first of all, I'd like to thank you all for being here and for coming out, from coming from all over the world, all across the country to join us and share this experience with us. So first of all, thank all of you for being here. And on, to be honest, 12 days ago, 13 days ago, we weren't really sure if we were gonna do this in person. Remember, we got the call, we were watching the COVID numbers, we were waiting to see what would happen, and then we made, we made a call as a team to bring you all here. So very grateful that you were able to join us. When we, and again, my team, we started planning this conference about a year ago, and we were talking about what we wanted to do. We were talking about how do we want the conference to look, but more importantly, at the end, what did we want to leave each of our delegates with? And we wanted you to leave feeling a little bit better, maybe a little more hopeful, maybe better equipped to handle adversity yourself and to facilitate growth in others as you navigate things you've been through, things you're going through, things you're going to go through. So we hope that this was an enriching experience for you all, because it certainly was for us. So thank you. Now, if you wouldn't mind taking out your cell phones, you should have received an email with a feedback form for our conference. So if you could take the next five minutes or so to fill this out, this will help us make conferences in the future much better. So thank you, and we'll give you five minutes to complete that form.